So our agenda for today is um, we're going to, I'll be giving you a high level overview of the systematic review steps and processes. And then Lauren will give a brief demonstration <clears throat> of the systematic search process in PubMed, kind of some basic steps for how you get started with the search. So we'll pause along the way to answer any questions that you may have. And then <clears throat> since there's just a few of us here today, please um, go ahead and use the chat box for your questions. Um, and go ahead and let me know what discipline you're in. Just go ahead and put that in the chat box as well um, so that we have an idea of which disciplines are represented here today. And again, if you, it's a small session, so um, if you wanna just unmute yourself to, air, to ask questions or, um, or you can put them in the chat either way. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying to go to my next slide. There you go. So we do have a couple of upcoming workshops that are kind of related to this one. We have, um, today will be an introduction to systematic reviews, and then we have the <coughs> translating searches for systematic reviews on October 27th, and then the new PubMed for systematic reviews on December 4th. And you can see um, on this link here, there's LibGuides. Uh, I, I think the link was sent to you when you received the um, reminder email. The, that link will have the re today's recording and any PowerPoint presentations for today. And also, um, it will have the links to the uh, upcoming webinars as well. So to get started, um, you know, what is a systematic review? According to the definition used by Cochrane Collaboration, a systematic review is a review of a clearly formulated question that uses a systematic and explicit methods to identify, select, and critically appraise relevant research and to collect and analyze data from studies that are included in the review. <clears throat> So a systematic review is a research study requiring a carefully thought out question, an investigative team, and a study protocol. <clears throat> so you can kind of think as subjects of a systematic review um, are to individuals for a primary study. So for example, like primary studies um, have individuals and then systematic reviews have um, the studies themselves. So that's kind of a way to think about what you're doing, what when you're doing a systematic review, what you're looking at, the data that you're looking at. So the role of the librarian throughout the systematic review process, um, this is kind of a um, an overview to help you understand why and how librarians can help you through this process. We, so we can help in the planning, conducting, and we're in stages of the process. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I'm a little bit, I have a little bit of a cold, so I have to keep coughing, so I apologize. Um, so as noted in the um, Institute for Medicine Standards for Systematic Reviews and in the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews, a medical librarian should be consulted from the start of the protocol and at various stages in the systematic review. <clears throat> So that's kind of, you know, how librarians are um, part of the process. <clears throat> so what are the steps in the systematic review? Obviously, librarians are highly involved in literature searching, and we can advise in the developing of a research question and creating the protocol. Uh, many, many researchers are unaware of this protocol aspect. So we can also be involved in reporting the results and generally the methods section of the manuscript um, would be written by librarian if we're given co-authorship. So if we do, um, we kind of have two methods of um, assistance within the medical center library. If you are wanting um, a librarian to be um, highly involved in the process and um, get do all the literature searching for you, get all the studies, um, extract them into EndNote and extract the data, <clears throat> and then write the literature 
methods section of the of the systematic review, we generally require that um, we be given co-authorship. But then the other um, the other option is just consultation. So we can consult with you and we can you know guide you along the process, but you do the literature searching yourself. Um, that's typically how we're involved um, at the medical center library. So librarians are typically not involved in the study selection, <coughs> evaluate and appraise and extract and synthesize steps. However, they can um, advise and be a part of the process of the subject expertise um, if they have subject expertise in that area. So the, uh, there are standards and um, guidelines for systematic reviews. So the National Academy of Medicine, formerly known as the Institute of Medicine, developed and defined methodological standards for conducting systematic reviews of healthcare interventions in 2011. Um, for systematic review authors, these standards serve as method methodological roadmap to conducting a rigorous review. <clears throat> the standard state that the systematic review must be based on an explicit transparent process that minimizes bias and conflicts of interest, be developed a knowledge, uh, by a knowledgeable multidisciplinary panel of experts and representatives from key affected areas, um, be based on a comprehensive and systematic be uh, based on a comprehensive and systematic search for evidence that addresses potentially bias in evidence reporting and use pre-specified methods to evaluate the body of evidence to critically appraise the quality of each included study. And then they synthesize <clears throat> the evidence in a manner that considers the strengths and limitations of the included study. I will um, distribute these hand, these this PowerPoint presentation. Um, it will be on the research guide for these workshops. So don't worry about um, getting the links down. Um, I, Kayla's put the links in the chat but you can uh, also use that link in the PowerPoint once it's available. <clears throat> so the, um, the systematic review standards and guidelines, um, we do have a systematic review guide that has links for um, the standards and the processes um, that you need to go by when you're creating a systematic review. We also have um, in addition to the systematic review guide, on that guide, there's several how-to ebooks on conducting systematic reviews in our collection. So um, there's some different tools that we have to help um, you begin before you begin the systematic review process. Um, Many a times um, students and faculty come to us and say, hey, I want to do a systematic review and we're, <laughs> they don't fully understand what that entails. So there's um, on the systematic review guide, there is information to help you begin the process. First, how can the library help you? Um, second is what you need to know before you get started. And the next step is which re review is right for you. So there's a lot of um, different types of reviews. And then um, there's a chart of review types. So sometimes a systematic review isn't really what you're wanting to do. You may be wanting to do a, scoped, a scoping review or a rapid review. And all of that information is on the um, systematic review guide. So let's go on to the steps in the systematic review process. The first step is to develop a um, is to create a focused, well-defined research question. So PICO is the, um, the most common one used in healthcare. However, there are other frameworks that exist. So if PICO doesn't work for you or your discipline, you can um, see if there's another format that works for you. The goal is for it to be a very specific and focused clinical question.
So then the next step is you're going to want to find um, potential articles. So you'll need to do a scoping search for few studies to um, that would be included in your systematic review or at or you need to um, you have to do that kind of searching to kind of get an idea of like, okay, you know, what topic do I want to do? And are there articles available on this topic? So you can use those um, system, those articles to help you harvest search terms for your um, for your systematic review. And so what I mean is that if you once you've found a couple of articles that are really good and you think would be included in your systematic review, you need to make sure that your final search strategy includes those articles. So finding potential articles and using the Yale Mesh Analyzer will help you develop your search terms. The analyzer will pull all the mesh terms found in the articles. You'll also need to search um, the databases, Cochrane, PubMed, Prospero, to make sure that no one has already done every research guide on systematic section specifically for finding existing systematic reviews. And the next step is to create a um, protocol. So a priority protocol is one that is generated prior to a research study taking place. So to include it to increase transparency, reduce bias and redundancy, the systematic review process includes the development of a protocol or a review plan before the review is undertaken. So the protocol details the evidence, location, selection, assessment, and synthesis plans. Without review protocols, how can we be assured that decisions made during the research process aren't arbitrary or that the decision to include or exclude studies or data in a review aren't made in light of knowledge about the individual study findings? So it's important to note that a review may deviate from its protocol, but these deviations must clearly be identified and explained in the final write-up. So let's move on to the study um, selection criteria. So an important element of the systematic review protocol is the development of explicit inclusion and exclusion criteria. The PICO elements of your key questions should be reflected in the selection criteria. The selection criteria will be used to screen evidence during the study selection step in the systematic review process. It is sometimes referred to as an eligibility criteria as it defines the study elements, what it defines the elements of a study um, must contain to be eligible for inclusion in that review. So, Lots of times inclusion criteria would be like population characteristics, interventions, outcomes, or study designs. An exclusion criteria could be sample size, co-interventions, duration of the intervention or exposure, or setting. The preliminary search strategy, um, you'll need to do this to help you begin to think about your topic. And so you can flesh out the inclusion and exclusion criteria and what databases to search. So um, for the Prisma, there is a, an extension called Prisma P for protocol. And it says that um, for your information sources, you need to describe all the intended information sources. So the electronic database, are you going to contact study authors, trial registries, gray literature? And then the search strategy, you need to present a draft strategy to be used in at least one of the electronic databases, including plan limits such that it could be repeated. So tools for um, creating a protocol. <clears throat> there are specific tools that guide you along the way as you develop your protocol. The Prisma, um, that's the most um, recognized standard tool that we have. It's called the um, it's PRISMA, it stands for the Preferred Reporting Items for Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis, and it's the standard tool that's used. It's a 27-item evidence-based checklist for reporting the systematic review process and related findings. It can serve as a rubric for developing a protocol as well, and a checklist for crafting the report of the systematic review. So we have links here again 
for all of these extensions. Um, there's a Prisma for scoping reviews, um, and then there's protocol guidance, and then the Prisma P for protocol. So um, registering your systematic review protocol promotes transparency and allows you to cite your protocol to a document and document in it a priori design and it allows readers to compare the reported findings with the pre-specified outcomes of interest. So Prospero and Open Science Framework are two, um, two ways that we encourage you to um, and suggest that you register your protocols. There are others listed on the systematic review guide, but these are the two most common. So the third step is the literature searching. Um, a systematic literature search of multiple databases via a search strategy that includes controlled vocabulary terms and concepts is an integral part of the systematic review as it minimizes biases inherent to narrative reviews. Initial search strategies should be sensitive, be able to capture all the relevant evidence rather than highly specific, which would be able to exclude irrelevant articles. The initial results should inform your search strategy. So you also need to make sure that you're searching um, based upon your PICO search strategy or whatever framework you use. You need to use controlled vocabulary and text words. Great. You need to search the gray literature. And gray literature is referred to um, as unpublished, unpublished information. So um, conference proceedings, clinical trials, um, and then again, unpublished studies. So if there's an author that um, wrote a study and completed the study, but it never got published, you need to contact the author. Um, and you'll know <coughs> who's, um, who's a relevant and um, highly authored in that field. So what databases should be searched? Um, to reduce the bias, multiple databases must be searched. Two to three um, are the minimum for every systematic review. Other databases should be determined by topic or discipline. And then one to two gray literature sources should be searched. Hand searching should also be done and cited reference searching for included studies. So you wanna make sure that of your included studies, you're also searching the references um, every article that they cite and then um, hand searching just means that if you're going, if there's a particular journal that you know um, is included in your study, they have articles published in your study, then you might want to double check the table of contents to see if there are any um, additional studies that you may have missed. So um, the subject equals the study. So the quality of the systematic review is dependent on the research studies included. So the lit search provides the pool of potential subjects. So this is why the literature search is um, critical to the quality of a systematic review. So in this um, slide, you can see that if this is like a graphical representation of the universe of studies. So the X's are um, not useful studies and the stars are useful studies. <coughs> Systematic reviews require maximum sensitivity to decrease the risk of bias. So precise results, this is what most literature searches do. Um, you're using like a precision model when someone asks for a literature search on a topic or you do a literature search um, yourself you're typically just looking for those precise results just a handful of articles that are really relevant to your topic however that's not the type of searching that's done in a systematic review search so in a systematic review search you want more comprehensive search which means it's more sensitive so you're going to have to wade through a lot of not useful results to find the useful ones. You'll notice that outlying useful studies, <clears throat> those little stars that are outside of the red circle. So those you'll find um, via other search methods beyond 
the traditional electronic databases. So if you're just doing an electronic database searching, you're not doing enough. <clears throat> so you'll know that you have a sensitive search if three to six records out of the 100 are relevant. And if your search has 50 to 100 relevant, then your search is not broad enough. So one thing that um, people ask me, they're like, where this is way too many results. But you have to keep in mind that 75% will be tossed out in the title abstract review, and another 75% will be tossed out in the full text review. So this is an area that um, faculty and students, they have a lot of difficulty with because they see this large number and they don't wanna review all those articles. But you just have to um, understand that that's the nature of a systematic review. The search is going to get, it's going to be very comprehensive and it's going to get a lot of results. And you have to be willing and open to um, review all of those articles. <clears throat> and it's not reviewing every individual article. I mean, let's say that real quick, because you have to do a title abstract review and that is, you know, quickly done. Um, so it's not as bad as it looks. So to meet the maximum sensitivity, um, how do you meet the maximum sensitivity? You search beyond your usual databases and you use more complex search statements. So you use controlled vocabulary, you use natural language such as text words is what we mean by that. Um, you use Boolean operators and then you have to be prepared to sacrifice precision because the search results are likely going to be large. So in this um, little graphic that I have here, this is a published study that was, um, they reviewed like 11,000 articles were identified through database searching, um, but only 20 of the 25 studies were included in the quantitative synthesis. So <clears throat> you have to be willing to um, go that extra mile. <coughs> And so every database has specific terminology um, and search functions that you'll need to be aware of. So for example, um, you need to know, does this database use subject headings? Do they use controlled vocabulary? Do they use proximity searching? Do they use truncation? Um, are your Boolean operators used appropriately? Are there line errors? Um, and so one of the things that, um, we can help you with as librarians we are experts in this type of searching so we can assist you in the process even if you're doing um, something if you're a graduate student <clears throat> and you're doing this for a, a class project or something like that you can always come to us for consultations <coughs> we just um, can't do it for you <laughs> But be sure to um, seek us out because we are, you know, the experts in this type of um, literature searching. And this is what we do. So to help with um, term harvesting, this term harvesting process, we do have um, w um, a search template. And I think that, um, yep, it's, they've linked it in the chat for you. Um, this is to help you gather key terms and natural language terms for each concept. <coughs> then identify mesh terms and entry terms. And then you identify the subject terms and the other databases that you're searching. And then all of those um, search terms for one concept are or together. And then the individual concepts are anded together to make the final search strategy. So um, it's a complicated process and the searching, you know, gathering all your search terms and searching the databases takes a lot of time. That's um, initially the upfront, it's very time consuming, but it is part of the process. And then documentation is key to the process. Your search must be replicable. So a flow diagram must be included with the number of results initially and after all the other sources are searched and after duplicates removed and then after screening. So um, your documentation is like key. You have to make sure that you um, 
have a plan and a process for documenting all the information, all of the all of the results in the databases. So if you um, have trouble with that, or if you've not done that kind of um, detailed documentation before, we can definitely help you with that process. And I'm just going to um, go through a couple more slides quickly and let Lauren do the demonstration. So the step four is the study selection. So study selection is the process of assessing the results of the systematic search. Study selection generally occurs in two phases. Phase one of study selection includes screening of titles and abstracts of studies retrieved via the systematic search. When keeping inclusion criteria in mind, be inclusive in this phase, erring on the side of caution and including studies of uncertain relevance. In phase two of the study selection involves screening of the full text articles included during phase one of the study selection. And then during phase two, the inclusion and exclusion criteria should be strictly applied. And with all steps of the systematic review process, Study selection should be um, conducted in a manner that is transparent and reproducible. So this is achieved through a clear priori, a priori definition of inclusion and exclusion criteria. Standards also dictate that a minimum of two assessors participate in study selection. Duplication of selection reduces the risk of error. There should also be a disagreement um, process identified and the review protocol that clearly defines how disagreements between assessors will be handled. So a consensus discussion or a third um, adjunctive. So step five is the evaluate and appraise. So the aim of a critical appraisal of evidence in the systematic review process is to establish the validity of the findings. So coming or synthesizing the results of poor quality primary research can lead to biased findings or misleading results. During the critical appraisal, the quality of each study included is reviewed and is assessed. Generally, a vetted quality assessment tool is employed to assess the quality. <coughs> the tools employed will depend on the design of the included studies. For example, a randomized controlled trial Reports can be assessed by using the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool for RCTs, while cohort studies could be appraised by either using the Robbins I or a Newcastle Ottawa scale. And we have links to all of these um, in the systematic review guide. So just as, with, um, just as with study selection, it's important to involve at least two assessors in the critical appraisal process to reduce the risk of bias. So the sixth step is to extract and synthesize. Once the studies have been identified in the review, reviewers extract information relevant to their research question from each individual study. The data collected should reflect the PICO elements of the review question. Here we see a list of um, commonly, commonly extracted data elements. These specific data elements extract will be dependent upon the PICO elements of the reviewers research questions and the scope of the review. Aligned with the previous steps of the systematic review process, data extraction should be completed in a transparent and standardized manner. Specifically, a minimum of two reviewers should engage in the extraction and use of standardized forms that have been piloted and tested on the selection of studies. And then the final step is reporting the results. So as mentioned previously, the Prisma checklist can be used to craft a systematic review manuscript that meets the minimum reporting standards. Fill in your Prisma flow diagram. And then the um, Equator Network, which is an enhancing quality and transparency of health research, has an online toolkit for writing and using reporting guidelines. So um, I went through that fairly quickly. So I want to um, pause for a minute and see if anybody has any questions before um, I'll let um, Lauren take over for the demonstration of building a search in PubMed. So does anybody have any questions so far? <coughs> Okay, 
Okay, well, I'll stop sharing my screen and let Lauren. Okay, sounds great. So I'm gonna actually uh, show you all a search that I've worked on um, with someone here, um, just to kind of show you the processes that I go through. I'm not gonna build a full search because they are quite time consuming, but I'll kind of show you how to do it and show you what my final result was. So first, what I usually, what I always recommend is to start with a set of articles. Um, so I'm gonna share these articles with you. Um, can you all see these here, this, these PDFs? Okay, um, so these, um, so the search question that I was given was do wearable inertial sensors capture gait variability or abnormalities in multiple sclerosis? So that's kind of where the question, um, or that is what the question was. And I asked the researcher to send me four articles, or, or not four, he sent me four, but there were several other, um, you, you can start with however many articles you have. Um, so these four articles um, would have been included if they were found in a search, essentially. And what's really beneficial about this is you can start looking at terms um, and word and different words in these articles. And as Stephanie mentioned, there's a tool called the Mesh Analyzer. So with these four articles, what I did first um, is I went to PubMed and I, I'm going to share that screen now. And I put those into PubMed so I could get these PubMed IDs. And every article inside of PubMed has a PubMed ID. So um, using these numbers, we can go to the Yale Mesh Analyzer and we can put in these four unique identifiers into PubMed and then you hit go. I don't, this is broken right now. Um, I don't know why um, it should be back up, but I do have it downloaded so I can show you what you get when you put these PubMed IDs into um, in, into the mesh analyzer. You essentially get a table. This table you can copy and paste into a Word document like I've done here. You can do it into Excel document, whatever your preference is. And this is really a great tool because it tells you all the various mesh terms that have been assigned to these articles. And what you can do then is go through and you can highlight different terms um, that are recurrent. So the goal is to come up with a list of terms that kind of defined all of these articles. So as you can see, I, I've highlighted some here, some of the subheadings. Um, I don't usually recommend including these subheadings. It was just a note that I was taking when I was building this. Um, there's things like gait disorder um, and, and disability evaluation. Um, acceleration is in two of them. So this is just um, an example of how you get those terms. Um, and then what's also nice is it gives you the author supplied keywords. And when you're building a sub, um, um, any type of search, you want to include subject headings and keywords. And the author supplied keywords is a great place to start because mesh might not always define what you're looking for. Um, or if you want to, or if, if you're going to or in mesh terms with keywords, um, like, like in gate analysis. Um, so this is a great way to start. What I do next is I start creating a list of terms. So here are my mesh terms. We have things like multiple sclerosis. Um, and I'm going to go into mesh here in just a minute and I want to show you a few things in there as well. Um, things like postural balance, walking, motion. Um, you can kind of see where I'm going with this. I'm building all of these terms. Um, I'm going to actually show you gait analysis. Let me share my screen to there. Okay, just gonna sign in. Let's hope it works. Okay, it's working. So here's gate analysis. So when you're looking um, at mesh terms and you're deciding whether or not you wanna add those, you wanna go to the mesh database. And you can access that from the PubMed page um, under mesh database here. Um, and then you can search for a term in the MeSH database. 
But since I already had the link here, here's where gait analysis is. And you're always going to have a definition. And I recommend reading those definitions because you're not always certain that a term, the way a term is defined is what you are really looking for. Um, I always give the example of mechanical ventilation. There's several different ways to define mechanical ventilation in mesh. Um, so it's important to read those variants and decide which ones are really what you're looking for. The next thing you want to take note of is the year introduced. So as you can see, um, gate analysis was only added in 2019. So when articles are added, um, they are indexed. But when a mesh data, a mesh term is added, those articles aren't going, they, they don't go back and read all the articles prior to 2019 and add that mesh term to it. So it's important to go down here and look at the previously indexed term. So in this case, we were interested in gate analysis articles prior to 2019. So we included gate as a mesh term. You can see that that goes back to 1981. So um, this is always, I think, a part where a lot of people get confused. Um, as Stephanie said, we're more than happy to help review your term list um, and know um, where to go with your various terms and mesh terms. Um, there's also this section called entry terms. This one's quite short, but this is different terms um, that you can use to define your subject. Um, so sometimes there's spelling variations, sometimes um, there's different names um, for different things that you can include. So for example, sorry, I lost all of my home keys. <laughs> um, all of my home keys. Um, here's multiple sclerosis. If you click on this one, there are several different entry terms um, here. And when, and I'll, I'll show you my search here in a minute, and I did include some of these as keyword searches. Um, another thing to note is the tree structure when you're deciding on a term. Here's the multiple sclerosis. And um, inside of PubMed, um, it's always going to explode is what we call it. So if you're searching multiple sclerosis, it's going to search everything underneath it. So it's gonna search both the relapsing and remitting and the chronic progressive versions. Um, I would, I, as far as I'm aware, PubMed's the only databases that automatically explodes. So you would have to tell other databases like CINAHL that has a, its own subject heading um, that you would want to explode it. So this is just something to consider when you're looking at terms. Sometimes you don't want to include the things underneath it and you cannot explode those as well. So, was that a chat? No. No, okay, <laughs> sorry, I just had a- <laughs> I'm monitoring uh, the chat. Great, okay. Um, and so next, once you get through mesh, I'm gonna go back and share my list here. Sorry for all the screen changing. Um, so, that's some that, so that's some information about the mesh terms. Then I also, um, in this case, IMUs or inertial measurement units, there wasn't really a mesh term that defined that. Um, so I used a lot of keywords. I used a lot of things like IMUs, um, wearable inertial sensors, and we kind of did those variants. Um, and then we also do keywords for multiple sclerosis, as well as here are all the ones I'm going to use for gait. So this is how I do it. Sometimes I color code them if there's a lot of different um, topics I'm going to be looking at, but this one was a pretty um, simple combination. Um, and some can have a lot of different areas that you're, you're searching. One I worked on what was about sensory. So I had a lot of the color coding helped me when I was trying to define sensory, right? So there's different ways you can do it. But this is kind of where you start is with your list of terms. Okay, so now I'm going to go to PubMed. And I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. So here's PubMed. I always go to the advanced search when I'm building a systematic review search. And I do this because of um, the availability of the index as well as the history. So um, what I do um, and what I recommend people to do is to start with one term. So like here's multiple sclerosis. 
and I add this to my history. And then I'm going to do that again um, with my title abstract and add to history. And the reason you're doing both the mesh term and the keyword or the natural language is because not everything has been indexed in PubMed. It takes time for indexers, which is an actual person reading those articles to index the article. So to catch the most recent articles or to catch things that are in PubMed Central, um, you need to include both the mesh term and the keyword. Um, also, when I'm doing this, I often um, start adding in the truncated version. And the reason I do this is because I want to see if the truncated version brings me any new results. I also think about if I'm going to be translating it into a new database like CINAHL, will that truncation help me when translating that search? Um, and then I also do abbreviations. Um, but for example, with this one, if I want to do MS, I'm going to do show index and you can see that it is in there 400, a little over 444,000 times. So that is something I'd want to include. You can also um, select uh, title abstract or text word are usually the two I recommend. I almost always do title abstract. Um, you can select that here and add it and add it to your history. Um, so that those are different ways to do it. There's also, um, I'm going to add this. You can also do some of the shortcuts like TIAB. Um, and it's going to do the same thing. So add to history. You can see that it's all doing the same thing. Um, and I keep doing this for all of my main terms. So I'm going to add all of these terms. And I just add them in really quick for multiple sclerosis. So, um, and as you can see, these truncated forms didn't really add anything. I'll show you in a second where it does add some results. Um, but then what I do is I do this by concept. Um, and there's, you don't have to do it by concept. You could add all your terms and search together. Um, but I usually do it by concept because it's important to know that the new PubMed only keeps 100 lines of history. So as soon as this hits 100, it's clearing off number one, number two. So just be aware of that. And I'll show you what I do. I always export things too. I'll show you my Excel document that I export things into. So um, what I usually do is I go here, I go to add query, and then I'm gonna use this truncated form. Um, I'm gonna add that one. Um, I'm going to add MS. I'm just oring all of these together because these are all defining the same thing. Um, and I didn't use, I didn't use both of these. I'm only using the truncated form. And then I add that to my history. And then that is my population. That is the group of people I'm looking into. Um, so, and then I would do that again with postural, uh, for, for all the postural balance terms and the walking and the motion and the gait terms. And um, then I do that, the same thing for wearable inertial sensors. And I'll show you what that looks like as well. Um, I just wanted to kind of show you the process using multiple sclerosis. I also wanted to show you, so for example, here's um, postural control. Um, I'm going to add that one and then I'm going to add the truncated version so you can kind of see the difference here. Okay, so you can see that there was a slight difference there. In this case, I would use the truncated version it means it might be that there's something else um, like posture control, controls, different variations like that that might be useful. Um, and that doesn't always work out. You just want to, if it jumps up um, to like 39,000, maybe it's something you're not really wanting. Um, but again, the, we're always here to give some advice on that if, it, um, if you do need that. Okay. So that's how you do, um, that's how I continue to build in PubMed. I'm going to show you what that looks like. You can always download your results here. It's going to download it as a CSV file that can open up in Excel um, or it can open up in numbers, whatever your preference is. Um, so I'm going to show you what that looks like here. Okay. So here's my Excel document. Um, you can see that I'm going to zoom in a little bit on it, so it might be a little bit easier to see. So here's all those multiple sclerosis um, terms that I had, um, and here's the number of results. I keep doing, I keep going up, and here's all my postural balance terms, my ambulation, my gait terms. I or all those together, and then I've added that in 
here. Um, so I've added the multiple sclerosis terms here. You can kind of see that. Then with all the postural balance terms. And now I'm going to go in and start adding the things that relate to inertial measurement units. Um, and I keep going up. And this is a really good example of ambulatory monitoring. Um, so this, there wasn't an exact mesh term that went with wearable inertial sensors, but some of the articles did have ambulatory monitoring attached to it. Um, so this was something um, that was related, um, but not exactly what it was. Um, and then you keep going up and then I combined again. So this, I know this looks really messy, um, but here's one multiple sclerosis string. Here's my postural balance string. And then here is my, I, my inertial measurement units. And you can see that I'm testing things out to see if I want to truncate um, and things like that. Okay, so then once you have your final search, um, it's good to go back and double check yourself. So I want to go look to see if those original four articles I showed you in the beginning that I did the mesh analysis on are caught by the search because then if they are, that I'm on the right track. It's a good place to start and send. And, and then um, I often share that with the PI and then they give me some feedback from there. So um, as you can see here, I ended that search with one of the uh, PubMed IDs here and one result came up. And you can see that I did that with all four results um, and they all came up in this search. So, um, that is my final search that I keep. And I always, as Stephanie said, it's really important to document. Um, and this is me over documenting. I can always go back and read my notes. I often keep notes over here, um, pa pass all the time and stuff. I keep the date I ran the search, all that stuff that would be really important if you're going to report how you did it. <clears throat> also in this Excel document, I keep all my history of my translations. And we have another session coming up later in the semester about translations. But um, I just wanted to go through and kind of show you what this really looks like when you're tracking it. Um, you're changing some of the, the syntax and different things like that. I also keep a history of the dates I ran the search. It's, um, I try to run them all on the same day. Um, and then um, I also keep track of the number of results and the database um, that I searched. So that's um, kind of just a quick rundown of how I do a systematic review search um, and how I build searches. Um, and I think we have a little bit of time for questions if there are any.